talk about sketchy decisions, convex low rank matrix optimization with optimal storage. Okay, well, thank you guys for all coming back here after when there's like coffee and uh, snacks outside. Um, so I'm going to talk about work. Um, this is joint work with um, Alp Hirtsever and Vulcan Sever at EPFL um, and uh, Joel Tropp at uh, Caltech. Um, so let's get started. So here's the basic problem that we were motivated by. Um, so let's suppose that we've got a convex optimization problem. Okay. Um, and we're going to suppose that the problem has a compact representation. So here I'm going to say that means that I can write down the problem using order n floating point numbers. Okay. Um, and um, I'm also going to suppose that I happen to know that I can represent the solution also using order n floating point numbers. So I've got some extra side information or who knows what. We'll see a lot of examples. Um, but the question is, how much memory does it take me to solve this problem? Do I, do I need, uh, I mean, so clearly I need at least order n memory because I have to be able to read in the data and I have to be able to write out the solution. Um, but uh, are, are there some cases where I might need more than order n memory? Um, or can I always get away with order n memory? Okay, I mean, that's, that's clearly the minimum. Can I always achieve it? Um, right, so we want to be able to solve the, uh, uh, any convex optimization problem using memory that's bounded um, by, the, uh, the, by the size of the problem data and the size of the solution. Um, so I'm not going to solve this. Unlike right, most people, they present a question and then they answer that question. And I'm very sorry. Um, I can't answer this question for you right now. Um, but I'm going to answer a, a related question. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to restrict to a subclass of problems. Um, that I think has interesting structure. So here um, we're going to consider um, an optimization problem, convex optimization problem with a matrix decision variable. Um, so a, an m by n rectangular um, decision variable. And the problems we're going to be looking at are problems of this form. Um, we're going to minimize some function of a linear map applied to that matrix, a linear map A applied to the matrix X, um, subject to a constraint on the Shatten 1 norm of X. Um, so the sum of the singular values of x, right? also known as the trace norm, also known as the nuclear norm. Um, I'm going to try to keep referring to it as the Shatten 1 norm just to be consistent. Um, and we're supposing that this function f is convex and smooth. Okay. Um, and I guess it's also going to be pretty important. right? So we're taking this linear map on x, and it's going to remember sort of d things about this matrix x. Um, and then we're, the, our objective depends only on those d things that we remembered about our matrix X. Okay, so um, for this to be a compact matrix optimization problem, we're going to assume that both the specification and the solution are compact, which means the problem data will use order n storage. Um, uh, uh, so um, what's the problem data? It's this um, linear map A and this function f, and I guess the scalar alpha, but that's um, no problem from a storage perspective. Um, and then the solution. So um, one way that we could be sure that we could represent the solution in order n would be if the rank of the solution was some constant r. Right? So we could represent the factorization of the optimal matrix x um, using sort of n times r numbers plus n ti uh, m times r numbers. Um, and uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to suppose that m is order n. Um, so they're sort of roughly the same size, or let's imagine that n is bigger than m. Okay, so everything says order n when it could mean order, you know, min of uh, a max of m and n. Okay. So when do we see? Uh, uh, I mean, first, I want to justify to you this is an interesting class of problems. So we should talk about um, when we see these kinds of problems. Um, also, um, the same, basically the same ideas work for the positive semi-definite case when x is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that case because it just makes things more confusing. But it, it's exactly the same. Um, OK, so um, let's, let's, let's try to think about whether we can achieve these goals um, for this class of matrices. Um, so using a first order method, um, what would happen? Right, we'd look at the problem data. Um, and then we'd have to write down the problem variable. So we could you know, write it down, compute gradients, compute projections of it onto the constraint. Right? Um, but as soon as we write down the variable, we've got an order n squared thing. Okay, so this immediately um, violates what we're trying to achieve. Okay. So um, our goal is to figure out how small can we make the memory and still uh, achieve a, a global convergence. Right? This is a convex problem. We think we should be able to get the same guarantees that you would expect from convex optimization. Right, so, so global convergence to the global optimum. Okay, um, so uh, what are some applications where you might see this come up? Um, one might be uh, matrix completion. Right? This is a pretty canonical problem at this point. Um, let's suppose that I've observed. Um, I've got a, a, a partially observed matrix M. 
Um, and so I've observed the entries ij in some index set omega. Um, and I want a matrix x that matches m as close as possible on those uh, observed entries. Um, and I'm going to add on some kind of a, a regularizer um, to make sure that uh, uh, the x that I recover isn't too complex. Um, it's going to you know, hopefully uh, 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 give me a matrix x that's close to the true matrix m. Um, so, um, OK, so in this case, uh, d is the number of observations, right? the number of entries of m that I've seen. Um, and A, this linear operator, is going to be the uh, a map that selects the observed entries, find the ij's in omega. Um, and here, f is just the, um, uh, uh, the square norm uh, minus the square norm of the, ob minus the observations. Um, so in other words, the, the things that we've observed are actually um, implicit inside f. We're, we're hiding them inside the function f. Um, OK, so when is this problem compact? So it has a compact specification. Um, as long as the number of observations is order n. Right? So it's like saying you've observed a constant number of entries in every row or a constant number of entries in any column. Um, you know, for a case like matrix completion where you're thinking these are movie ratings, that makes sense. right? Most uh, 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 watchers of movies have only watched a constant number of movies. Right? The number of movies they watch doesn't actually grow as the number of movies grows. Um, and uh, the solution is compact if the rank of the optimum is constant. Okay, so oftentimes people will, um, well, they'll say things at this point, like, right, why, why, why do we expect that the rank of the solution should be constant? Right? They say, well, um, we think that um, um, movie ratings should be well approximated by a low rank matrix because somehow um, every person, uh, their preferences are described in terms of a small number of parameters. Like maybe there are a small number of genres um, for every movie, and the person's preferences are, you know, only depend on those genres. Um, but then you, you, you come across a different setting, like you've got a word document matrix. Um, and people will say, oh, maybe this word document matrix is approximately low rank um, because uh, there aren't too many topics. Right? So from how for every new setting, people posit some other kind of um, sort of simple kind of underlying structure that should be explaining why these things are low rank. Um, and I had uh, I, I encountered enough uh, applications of this in like, you know, uh, even in like sort of hospitalization records that turned out to be low rank or responses on social surveys that it started to um, make me feel a little bit strange that I kept making this assumption that there was some underlying thing, uh, sort of simple little structure about the world that caused things to be low rank. Um, and so, um, uh, so we, um, right, so, 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 so you could ask, right, why, why do you think there's a good approximation to M um, with constant rank? Like, isn't that a little bit, I mean, right, for, for any sort of generic data matrix, that seems like a kind of strong thing to say. Um, so it turns out that you can actually prove that this should be true under relatively weak assumptions or something almost like this. So I'm actually going to do a, this is a, a quick aside, um, not part of the uh, sketchy decisions, just to um, tell you why you should think that things are approximately low rank. Um, OK, um, under a, a relatively simple model. Um, so let's suppose that our data table A um, is generated by a latent variable model. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Um, that means that um, for every row, we're going to draw some latent variable IID from some distribution. Um, for every column, we'll draw some other latent variable IID from some distribution. Let me sort of draw what I'm talking about. Um, so I've got M rows and columns. For every row, I've got some latent variable drawn IID. For every column, I've got some latent variable drawn IID. Um, and the uh, entries in this matrix are just some function applied to the latent variable for the row and the latent variable for the column. Okay, so if that function were an inner product and these guys were low dimensional, right, then this would automatically be a low rank factorization and this would be a low rank matrix. Okay, but if these things are sort of arbitrarily high dimensional and this function is like an arbitrary function, then there's no reason to believe that this is low rank. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of exactly right. the assumption people make. It. They say, this is low dimensional, and this is an inner product, and that seems kind of implausible. Okay, but this is a, a lot more general. Um, OK, so in order to prove anything, um, I needed to make a couple of technical assumptions. I don't think they're too strong. Um, so let's suppose that these distributions, A and B, have bounded support, um, and that this function G is piecewise analytic. Um, and on each piece, the derivatives grow no faster than exponentially in the order of the derivative. Okay, so um, 
any polynomial of bounded degree satisfies this. Um, X of any polynomial of bounded degree satisfies this. Um, so most kernels that you might use. Um, so it, it, we think it's pretty general. OK, so suppose we're in the setting. Um, and the question is, how does the rank of an epsilon approximation to this matrix A grow as the size of the matrix grows? So as M and N grow, right, we can generate more and more matrices from this model, from the same latent variable model. Right? How does the rank of this thing grow, or an approximation to the rank? And the sense in which we want to approximate it um, here is the sense of, um, it, it's actually, this is kind of a strong sense of approximation. Right? It's the infinity norm. So um, we want to approximate every entry to within epsilon. Okay, so how large do you think the rank should be in terms of um, m, n, and epsilon? How fast should the rank grow? Well, I mean, well, clearly the rank is right. It's always bounded by the min of m and n. Okay, but like log of epsilon squared. Log. Okay, so you want it to be um, log of the sum of the side lengths over epsilon squared. Excellent. Excellent. Um, right, so the rank rank grows as the log of the sum of the side lengths. Right, so the one over epsilon squared is sort of unfortunate, but for a sort of data table perspective, it's not so bad um, because usually you don't expect to be able to approximate someone's rating for a movie to within like 0 0.001, like 0 0.1 would be pretty good. Um, okay, so as the side length grows, you get um, the the rank growing as the log of the sum of the side lengths, which I know log isn't the same as constant rank, but it's you know, what's a log between friends? Okay. So, um, so the, the, our statement of this is that nice latent variable models are log rank. Okay, so this makes me feel a lot more comfortable assuming that every data table I've ever seen is approximately low rank as long as the size of the data table is large enough. Okay, so that's an addendum. Okay, um, right, but just justification for why I believe that um, we should be able to find solutions that are, that are low rank. Okay, um, here's a totally different application. Um, uh, once again, we're going back to this um, compact matrix optimization problem. Um, so we're going to suppose that we've got an image with n pixels, um, which I'm going to call x natural. Um, so it's going to live in a complex vector space. Um, and the way that I'm going to acquire measurements of this image um, is that I'm going to be able to take inner products of the image with some vector ai. Um, it might be a, a Fourier transform at a particular frequency. Um, and I'm going to uh, measure the um, the norm squared of that, um, plus some noise. Okay, so these measurements don't look linear, um, but there's an easy trick to make them look linear in some other space. Um, so I can relax. So um, if, uh, uh, let's suppose that I, I have this matrix X, that's just X natural, X natural star. So a rank one matrix. Um, and then I can rewrite this observation. Um, so I'm gonna expand it out, um, rewrite it using the trace, and then use the, um, the cyclic permutation variance of the trace to find that it's a trace of ai star ai times this rank one matrix x. Okay. Um, and so this is nice because this is a linear measurement on x. Okay. So I can rewrite my, my, my whole problem um, in terms of this um, big matrix x rather than the original image x natural and suddenly my observations are linear in my new variable. Um, and uh, the cost is that now my variable is this matrix variable instead of a, um, a one dimensional um, vector. Uh, n-dimensional vector. Um, so if I solve this problem and at the end I get a, a vector in Rn, right, a, a rank one matrix, then I can actually um, figure out from that rank one matrix what x natural is. Right? If the solution isn't rank one, then maybe I'm not even so interested in the solution at all. Um, actually, um, so if you talk to people who actually do um, a phase retrieval, right, they, they look at this kind of uh, measurement often. Um, so often, the, the, uh, let me just say, so the number of measurements that you would take is something like four or five times the dimension of the signal n. Um, and it turns out that, the, the, so the ranks that we were getting for these solutions um, turned out to be like five. Um, and there's a, turns out to be a very good reason for that, which is that we're not actually using the Fourier transform. We're using the discrete Fourier transform. And there's some discretization error introduced every time you discretize, taking your picture of your, of your, um, imi uh, of your um, sort of actual substrate at a different angle. Um, and so the discretization error is different for each sort of um, order n uh, picture that you collect. Um, so it, it's, it's like for each discretization area, you get one rank one matrix. So if you took sort of five fit pictures at different angles, you get a rank five matrix. So, so actually the, the fact that it's not rank one is like 
actually kind of fundamental to the problem. So um, anyway, but, but in either case, uh, the rank of the solution is constant. Okay. Um, and it's compact if the number of observations is order n. Um, and, and I guess the hope is, right, you shouldn't have to acquire you know, many more observations than the number of pixels you're trying to recover, right? It's sort of, uh, you should expect that the number of observations you would need would grow linearly with the, um, with the size of the thing you're trying to reconstruct. Um, okay, so sort of generally, what are some reasons why we'd expect a compact matrix optimization problem? Um, well, one is that data is expensive, and so we'd want to collect sort of a constant amount of data um, sort of per row or per column. Um, and then the second is that, right, so if the solution is compact, right, then a compact specification should suffice, right? We should be able to use sort of order the same amount of data as the size of the solution. Um, and then why should we expect a compact solution on the other side? Um, so the usual explanation is like the world is simple and structured, um, but it turns out we don't have to make that assumption. We can just say, well, um, maybe my data comes from an isolation variable model and those are approximately log rank. Um, uh, there's another justification you can give, which is that um, for any SDP, um, if the SDP has D constraints, um, then there is a solution with rank order square root of D. Um, now, square root is even more unlike constant than log, um, but um, it's something. Okay. Um, so, optimal, what do we mean by optimal storage? Um, how low a storage um, could we expect? Um, so, we're going to assume, um, right, to sort of make things concrete, that we've got a black box implementation of this operator A. So that means someone else is implementing A for us. We don't care what they're doing. Um, but we're going to need to be able to apply A to a rank one matrix or apply a conjugate to a vector and then take the inner products, uh, uh, take, um, so, so that the result of that is a matrix, and then apply that matrix to things on the left and things on the right. Okay. So it's sort of at the right, those are all the three operations you could possibly imagine doing with A. Um, so we'll need to be able to do each of them, which means we need enough storage for the inputs and outputs of those operations. Okay. So we'll need at least order um, M plus N plus D storage just to apply the linear map. Um, and then on the other side, if we expect a rank R solution, right, we'll need at least order R times M plus N storage just to write down the solution. Okay. So um, sort of optimal storage would be storage no more than that. Um, so that means the working storage should be order D plus R times M plus N. Okay, so that's, that's what we're shooting for. Okay, so um, right, we know we can specify the problem using um, order N bits of storage, uh, floating points, um, uh, 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 numbers. Can we solve the problem using older, only order N floating point numbers? Um, and, and you should remember if we ever write down the variable right before it's low rank, we've already failed. Um, so we have to solve the optimization problem without writing down the variable that we're optimizing over. Um, OK, so uh, how do other people solve these kinds of problems? Um, this is a, <coughs> sorry, um, a very brief and biased history of uh, matrix optimization. So in the 90s, you probably use, would have used interior point methods for this kind of problem. Um, but uh, those, uh, the storage scales extremely poorly um, for that kind of method. Um, uh, in the 2000s, people started using convex uh, first order methods. Um, much more like accelerated proximal gradient um, and other sort of similar methods. Um, and these do require you writing down the matrix variable so you can compute gradients and proxies of it. Um, uh, more recently, there's been a, a, a renewed interest in um, low memory methods. Um, and there's sort of two different approaches that people have taken. Um, one is to, to try to look for storage efficient first order optimization methods. Um, one of the main approaches here is to use the conditional gradient method, also called the Frank-Wolf method. Um, and uh, this has a nice property that at every iteration, the update to your current iterate is rank one. So it means that the rank of the iterate is bounded by the number of iterations. So if we've done t iterations, the, the, rank, the, the, the storage cost is then t times n plus n. Um, so that's nice, except that um, these methods converge really slowly um, for this class of problems. They're, they have like a, um, a, a, a 1 over epsilon um, convergence rate. So um, usually you expect that the number of iterations is going to be quite large. Um, uh, by the way, uh, so enough people have asked me this that I should clarify. So um, if your loss is strongly convex, uh, you've got a strongly convex function of a linear function. If your constraints were polyhedral, then you get linear convergence for Frank Wolf. But our constraints are SDP constraints, not polyhedral constraints. So we do get the slow rate, not the fast rate for Frank Wolf. Okay. 
Um, so, uh, so, so, so indeed, the number of iterations can be large. Um, so there are variants on this. Um, you can do things like um, pruning the factorization, like trying to find um, maybe uh, rank one components you've added but aren't so important. Um, or you can actually seek rank reducing steps. So you can consider a bunch of different possible update directions and try to go in one that reduces the rank rather than increasing it. Um, and those, uh, for some problems, they work quite well. Um, but you can't guarantee that they will always work well. Um, so we don't like there can be problems where the rank actually grows quite high, um, and we have seen that in practice. Um, okay, so the other major approach to this kind of problem um, would be uh, uh, non-convex heuristics. Um, so um, what those do is they 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 take the matrix variable um, and they factor it, um, and they rewrite the problem in terms of this factored variable, um, and suddenly the problem. I mean, it actually, it usually becomes a um, a, a smooth optimization problem. So um, it's quite fast to just do gradient descent. Um, you often converge linearly to the solution, um, but you can't guarantee that you will converge to the global solution um, because you've written down, right, your problem is now non-convex. Um, and um, I'll show you some examples where um, we, we actually tried pretty hard to get these methods to work, and they were not able to sort of find um, what looks like the right solution on this, um, on this problem. So, um, they work well under statistical assumptions. You can prove they work well. Um, but if you're just given some data, right? Some some you know biologist says here I have this you know data that I took with my microscope. Um, you know please uh, reconstruct for me the image. You can't guarantee um, that these uh, uh, measurements obey the statistical assumptions that you need. And indeed they sometimes fail in bad ways. Okay. Whereas the convex methods are robust, right? This is one of the things that people like about convex methods. Okay. Uh, so it seems like the convex methods are slow memory hogs, but they have guarantees. Um, and the non-convex methods are sort of fast and lightweight, but brittle. And we want the best of both worlds. Okay, so um, the method that I will be telling you about is based on um, the conditional gradient method, Frank Wolf. Um, so uh, what does that look like? Um, uh, so you start in an iterate xt. Um, you take a step. You compute the gradient um, of, of the objective at xt. Um, so this is a, the negative gradient direction. You go as far as possible in the negative gradient direction while staying inside the constraint set, which here is this um, uh, 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 Shatten one norm ball. Um, that point, that extreme point, is your update direction. And you move in the update direction. Okay, so that's the, right, that's the way that this method looks. Um, so here I'm just writing it down in math. Um, compute the gradient, set the search, compute the search direction. Um, choose a step size and then um, go uh, in the direction of that uh, search direction uh, by an amount of the step size. Okay, so um, okay, so there are two things that um, are sort of worth remarking on. Um, one is that you you need to be able to efficiently compute um, the solution to this problem, which is just a linear optimization problem. So minimize a linear function over the constraint set. Right? If you can't do that easily, then you should not be using the conditional gradient method. Um, and the second is that you can actually compute a bound on the suboptimality. So this, um, in terms of uh, computable quantities, like the update direction and the current iterate. So that provides a really nice stopping criteria. And you can tell when you're within epsilon of optimality, uh, uh, of, of objective function optimality, um, which, which you can't do for the non-convex method. So this is, this is actually really nice. Um, OK, so what about the search direction? How do we compute the search direction um, efficiently? Um, well, OK, so if I, if I want, um, I want uh, uh, an x that has bounded sum of singular values that will be, go as far as possible in some particular direction. Right? It has a maximum inner product with something. Um, so the way to do that is I look at the largest singular value of the matrix negative g. Right? And um, I should just go in that direction. Right? So I take the largest singular vector of g, right? and I put everything I have I put in that direction. Okay, so it turns out the solution to this is always rank one. Um, and you can compute it just by computing the maximum singular vector of g. So for us, that's really nice because it means we don't need to write down g. We only need to be able to compute its maximum singular vector, right? which we could do using like a Lanchus method. right? So just applying it to vectors and applying its conjugate to vectors. So we wouldn't have to ever write down g, which is good because g is an n by, n by n thing. So we, we can't write down g. Okay, so, so far, things are looking um, promising. Um, so here's what the algorithm looks like. Um, so we start with like, an initial x. Um, for every iteration, we compute the maximum singular vector of the gradient. Um, we say that that is our update direction. We evaluate the stopping condition, and we take the step. 
Okay, but we need to get rid of, right, we're not allowed to write down x. Right, so we're going to need to get rid of x. Um, so what's interesting is that for this algorithm, you can do that. So um, um, there are two sort of big ideas that we're going to be using. Um, one is to use this low dimensional dual variable, um, a applied to x, um, to drive the iteration. So rather than keeping track of x, we'll keep track of z. Okay. Um, the second idea is that we're going to recover the solution to this problem from a small randomized sketch of x. Okay, so um, this, uh, this is the origin of the name sketchy decisions. We're sketching the decision variable. So the, the, the name of the game is right. We can't write down x until it's already low rank. Okay. So we're going to look at this problem. And every time we see x, it turns out there's an a in front of it. Right, so every time we see an m by n thing, there's an a in front of it. Um, in fact, even here, right, I'm, I'm writing down h, which is an m by n thing. But once I actually use it, there's an a in front of it. Okay, and here, right, I'm updating x, but since I only use a times x, right, I might, might as well not update x, but update a times x. Okay. Um, I'm giving you the gory details because otherwise it seems like magic, and I, I like it if right, you, it's not magic. Um, okay, so I'm going to replace all the ax's with z's. Okay, um, and I replace uh, right, so a h. Um, I just apply a to this rank one matrix. And that's one of the um, black box oracles that I, I said I could rely on. OK, so I've gotten rid of anything that's order mn. Right? This is, right, I, am, I am computing like, the iterates of this algorithm are exactly the same as the previous one. Um, and I've gotten rid of everything that's order m times n. Okay, so this is order, right, order n storage right here. Okay. Um, the iterates are the same. The objective values are exactly the same. It's just the same algorithm. Um, the only problem is that when I'm done, I don't have the solution. Right? I, I don't have x here. Right? And you might hope that I could just recover x from z, um, but that's not always possible. So think about the matrix completion case, um, where you can exactly complete the matrix. Okay. If you can exactly complete the matrix, that means that the solution z is actually 0. Okay? But if I tell you, right, here's, here's order n entries in, in this matrix. Now exactly complete this matrix. Just tell me what the rest is. That's, right, that's, <laughs> I think that's why you're solving the problem to begin with. Right, that's, a, that's a hard problem. So just because you tell me you can exactly complete it doesn't tell me what the answer is. And I'm in the same situation here. Just because you tell me z doesn't mean I can figure out what x is. Okay. Um, so we solved the problem. We need to find the solution. Okay, it's a, it's, I feel like it's a strange situation to be in. <laughs> um, OK, so here's where the second idea comes in. We're going to sketch the solution. Um, and since the entire morning was on sketching, you now, now, now know how to sketch extremely well. Um, so you know that there are a wide variety of sketches you might use, um, depending on your circumstances. Um, I'm going to give you um, a particular example. But the basic uh, idea is very simple. Um, we know that the solution is going to be a low rank matrix. And low rank matrices are like they don't have too many parameters. Right? So if we, um, if we find a matrix x, uh, right, right, so. Um, uh, x hat that, that sort of acts like x star, right? And x star, you know, doesn't do that many complex things. It's just a low rank matrix. Um, then, then we actually have x star. Um, this is meant to be like the, the quote, you know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it is a duck, only for low rank matrices. Um, okay, so we're going to see a series of additive updates. We're going to remember how the matrix acts, and we're going to reconstruct a low rank matrix that acts like x. Um, okay, so. Um, what does that look like? Um, this is like the simplest possible sketch that you can come up with. Um, you can make it fancier. It doesn't actually help you very much in this context. Um, so uh, we're going to drop two independent standard normal matrices. Um, each one is going to be um, sort of dimensions of sort of one, one, one side of our matrix times something that's order r, order the rank, so constant. Okay? Um, and these are just so, so random Gaussian matrices. Um, and the sketch consists of two matrices that are going to try to capture the range and the co-range of x. Um, so if I multiply x by this random Gaussian matrix on the right, right, every column in the resulting matrix y is going to be in the range of x. And the hope is that these columns actually span the full range of x. So I can reconstruct the range of x from the columns of y. Okay, and, and that's true as long as you know omega is sort of with high probability, as long as omega cho is chosen randomly and, um, and k is larger than r. 
So which it is. Um, and then we'll do the same thing with the rows. So um, we'll, we'll write psi times x. Um, and that means that the rows of w should capture the, the row space of x. Okay. That, that, like that should be enough, right? It's a low rank at the end, right? If x were a low rank matrix, this should be enough to figure out what it was. OK. Um, so uh, since right, we're not seeing x, right? We're not seeing x star. We're seeing these rank 1 updates to x star. Um, it turns out that these rank 1 updates we can perform on the sketch instead of on the matrix itself. So if we're adding a make rank 1 matrix to x, we can update the sketch by applying that rank 1 matrix on the left to omega and on the right to psi. Okay, and these are both easy things, right? We don't have to form this m by n matrix. We just apply psi to u and then apply the result to v. Easy. Um, OK, so both the storage cost for the sketch and the arithmetic cost of this procedure are um, all order r times m plus n. So right, they're all allowed. Okay. Um, OK, so to recover the rank R approximation from the sketch, um, what we're going to do is three pretty simple operations. We'll do a tall, skinny QR. Um, we're going to do a small QR plus a back substitution, um, and then a tall, skinny SVD. So all of these operations are order like um, uh, order m plus n. There's nothing um, m times n about them. Um, and there's a, I think we need a quadratic in R. Um, so the, 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 the result you can prove about this um, is the following. So if you sketch a matrix X and you reconstruct it using this procedure, um, what you'll get is a rank R matrix X hat that satisfies the following guarantee. Um, the expectation of, right, over the way that you chose the random, right, the random sketch of X minus X hat in Frobenius norm is less than twice the, difference between the, the, the Frobenius norm of the difference between X and the best rank R approximation to X. So um, and this two, actually, you can make it as small as you want by choosing the sketch wide enough. But for us, two is good enough. Um, I guess it's worth remarking when x is actually rank r, then this right hand side is zero, and so that means the left hand side is zero. Um, so that's cool. Um, actually, so so what's weird? So after we figured this out, um, um, we found uh, that there's a, a so Woodruff, uh, David Woodruff had previously. Um, written down sort of a, a procedure that's almost the same. Um, it, it sort of took a while to, to reconstruct that they were the same. They were sort of hidden. Um, it was algebraically the same, but not numerically the same. So when we tried implementing his method, like the, 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 we just weren't getting the results that we needed for this optimization result. Um, whereas if we, you just did a, a little bit more careful numerical analysis, um, the results improved a lot. So um, it, it's sort of interesting noticing the um, uh, uh, right, the, the things that right, the uh, TCS community cares about and the things that like, numerical an and analysts care about. Right? Even when we're interested in the same problem, somehow we don't necessarily speak the same language. Um, but I think it's really cool that there's this um, sort of connection all the way through here. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to give you intuition for why the sketch works. OK, so um, I mean, it's quite simple. OK, so suppose you had an orthonormal basis Q for the range of x. Um, OK, well then clearly x is q, q star times x. Right? It's a basis for the range of x. OK, um, okay so, um, but we don't have a basis for the range of x to begin with. Um, what we can do is we can take this sketch of, of the range of x, right? x times omega. Right? That was the thing that was supposed to span the same range as, as x. Um, and we can do a QR decomposition on that. So that Q, we're really hoping that Q still spans the range of x. We're hoping that Q is a basis for the range of x. OK, um, okay so then also if, if we have the, um, the sketch of the co-range, so W is psi times x. right? So W, the rows of W are supposed to span the rows of x. Um, so we'll rewrite this right? because we know that x is approximately equal to Q, Q star times x. Um, and so we'll look at this and we'll say, well, um, that means that if I, if I uh, take the pseudo inverse of psi times q, this is a small matrix. It's like an order r by order r matrix. And I will pseudo uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring it over to the other side. Um, and I get, I get this thing is about equal to q star times x. Okay. So that means we can reconstruct x using x is equal to q times q star times x by just applying q to both sides. Okay. And these are all things that we know how to compute. So what's really cool about this, right, is that um, I don't need to, 
I don't need to like learn something about x in order to know which entries of x I need to collect. Right? I can just collect a random sketch of x from the beginning. Um, and so that's what it allows me to sort of combine it with this optimization algorithm that has these additive updates. Right? I don't, you know, so I can't say, I can't, for example, sample proportional to the diagonal of the matrix. Sample sort of off diagonal is proportional to the di diagonal because I don't know what the diagonal is going to be in the end. Right? So it's really important that I have uh, this linear sketch, um, a single pass sketch. OK, um, let's get back to the optimization picture. OK, so I'm going to add the sketch into the optimization algorithm. Um, and, and it's not changing the algorithm at all. The iterates are exactly the same. Nothing changes. Um, all that's happening is I'm collecting some side information. So at every iteration, I also update my sketch um, using this sort of update direction um, and saying how much I'm going to update it, the step size. Um, and at the end, I just reconstruct um, the solution from the sketch. Okay. It satisfies the guarantees I told you about earlier. OK, so um, if I just rewrite those guarantees, in terms of the, you know, the iterates of this conditional gradient method, here's what I get. Um, so let's, let's say that XTCGM is the teeth iterate of this conditional gradient method. Um, the, uh, if, I, if I do sort of the, um, uh, the floor with an R, that's the best rank R approximation to the CGM iterate. And I'll say X hat upper T is the, the, the sketchy CGM reconstruction that I would make if I reconstructed after T iterations. Okay, to get the guarantees, I'm not allowed to sort of constantly reconstruct. I have to decide when I'm going to reconstruct and then reconstruct. I can only do it once. Um, OK, so after t iterations, um, the reconstruction will satisfy exactly the same bound you saw before for this sketch, which is just that the expectation of the difference between my reconstruction and the actual iterate is less than twice the distance between the actual iterate and the best rank R approximation for the iterate. So in particular, if the iterate is rank r, the right-hand side is 0, so the left-hand side is 0. In other words, I have in hand the solution to my problem. So that's cool. Um, great. OK, so graphically, um, what does this look like? Um, so let's let this, uh, this, this squiggly thing, um, that's going to be the manifold of rank less than or equal to r matrices. I, I don't think it actually looks like that, but I don't know how to draw it. Um, so um, we're going to start off on this manifold, right? Zero, the zero matrix is on this manifold. Um, and we believe that we're going to um, converge back to this manifold in the end, right? That the, the solution, right, the, 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 the iterate that, that uh, the CGM iterates are converging to is on this manifold, which I'll call XCGM. Um, hmm. OK, sure. OK. So, um, right. So, so what I'm going to do is sort of follow the iterates. Like, I'm not going to write them down, but I'm going to kind of follow them. And then at the end, when I get back to this manifold and I reconstruct, since it's on the manifold, I will exactly get x, um, x hat is equal to xcqm. OK, but that's not usually what happens, right? Because I never get exactly, right? I never, I never iterate my iterative algorithm all the way to the end. Instead, I stop at some point, right? So when I stop at some point, right, I might not be at the solution, which means I'm not quite back to this manifold of rank R matrices. Okay? So in that case, the guarantee that I get is that the, the reconstruction that I make, it's definitely on, right? It's definitely a rank R matrix. It's definitely on this manifold. Um, and the distance between it and the last iterate is no more than twice the distance between the best rank R approximation and the last iterate. Okay. So that's the form of the guarantee that I get. Okay. Um, so I so there's this funny mismatch. So um, at this point, I can tell you um, a bound on the suboptimality of this point. Okay, but once I once I do this reconstruction, I can tell you how far it is in iterate space. So I know how close this is to the solution in terms of objective value. I know how close this is to this in terms of iterate space. Um, but to get a sort of complete bound on either the objective value or the distance to the solution. I would have to be able to either bound the distance from this to the solution or bound sort of how far this changes my objective value. And to do either of those, I'm going to need something like strong convexity. Um, so if I assume something like strong convexity, um, then I can um, give you a, a, a bound on how far my reconstruction is from the optimal iterate as a function of the iteration counter. Okay, but if I don't assume something like strong convexity, then I can't get a, um, I can't get a rate. But, I, I think this is sort of the right, um, um, uh, uh, this is the, the sort of the correct rate in spirit. Um, okay. So it's like a 1 over t rate. 
Um, OK, so let's go back to the um, application. This is actually work well. Um, so we're back to our phase retrieval application. Um, we've got an image with n pixels. We're going to acquire these noisy measurements of the um, norm of the, um, of, of the inner products between some vectors and the pixels. We're going to recover the image by solving this compact matrix optimization problem using a whole bunch of methods, including ours. Um, and the things we're interested in are um, you know, how fast is this method, how much memory does it use, and also um, what quality solution does it produce. Okay, so when we're comparing, so, so we think uh, it makes sense to compare, since this is a convex method, we're going to compare it to the convex methods in terms of its memory. But of course, all the convex methods converge to the same solution, so it's not very interesting to say what solution do they converge to. I'll compare to the non-convex methods um, in terms of what solution do they converge to. Okay, so um, if we compare it to a bunch of different convex methods, we see as the length of the signal grows, the number, the amount of memory that the um, algorithm uses also grows, um, and ours grows less quickly than all the others because ours is growing linearly, and um, most of the others are growing quadratically. So that's not a surprise. Um, indeed, the, um, uh, the convergence, so the error as a function of number of iterations, um, is a, it's a we do get a one over t rate. So this is a log log plot, and this is a one over t rate. Um, so um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's not very fast. We do require a large number of iterations. Um, OK, so more interesting um, is to um, actually see how it does on real data. Um, so here, this is an example from Fourier tychography. So this is a particular kind of phase retrieval. It's a Fourier tychography. What it means is it's a particular kind of experimental setup, a particular kind of microscope and kind of observations that you get. Um, and here what we're doing is we're imaging blood cells, and we are looking for malaria. Um, so the malaria is going to appear as sort of little white bright patches on these blood cells. Okay. Um, so the problem is large enough that we're not able to apply the other convex methods. Um, and I guess that's a little bit interesting. So we can run our R method with the parameter R set to be like 6 or maybe 10 or something. And when we do this, the, um, the matrix that we reconstruct, right, which is allowed to have rank up to 10, actually has rank 5. Um, and that's, that's a, a right based on the sort of the story that I told you before, that, that's actually what you should expect um, because of the, um, the way that you get the, this sort of truncation error in the discrete Fourier transform. Um, OK. <coughs> um, so if we could compare um, the results of running our method to results of um, two non-convex methods, Burr-Montero and Verdinger flow. Um, so, so by the way, we played around a lot with these methods. We tried quite hard. We like twiddled the parameters um, quite a bit to try to get them to converge to nice solutions. And we weren't able to make these like weird squiggly artifacts go away, like the ripples. Um, and we think that's just because the problem is pretty ill-conditioned. Um, this is just like the kinds of measurements here are kind of terrible kinds of measurements. Um, and these non-convex methods just don't perform very well um, on this kind of measurement. Um, Whereas the solution that we get is actually sort of um, um, smooth, decently resolved. Um, and so if you're looking for these little malaria squiggles, um, so they're in here, these little white patches, little white patches. Um, it's kind of weird to look for them here because the, um, the ripples actually look like little white patches. Um, so for the actual application, I mean, you can argue about right which picture looks better. but. Um, um, I'd say the convex method is, is showing the fact that it's a little bit more stable, um, more robust um, than the non-convex methods. And there are no parameters to twiddle. Like, it just works. Um, in fact, the alpha, um, the, the bound on the, um, the, the, the bound alpha that you need on the um, uh, Schatten 1 norm is something that we have good theoretical bounds for. Um, OK. So um, what's the, um, right, what's the conclusion? Um, so uh, this is really just a proof of concept convex method for a particular class of compact matrix optimization problems. Um, and there are two new ideas that really make this possible. Um, one is to drive the algorithm using a smaller dual variable. Um, and the other is to be able to sketch and recover the, the decision variable from the sketch. Um, so I mean, ultimately, I'd hope that we could do this for a much wider class of problems. Right? There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do this for like, you know, every SDP that, that I know of. Right? Um, I mean, I think it's a real question. Right? Is, um, does convex optimization have a higher memory um, requirements than non-convex optimization for, for the same sort of kinds of problems? And that's not yet clear. Um, 
Cool. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, have you ever tried combining sort of what you're proposing in the non-convex methods? Like in the non-convex case, if you converge to just a stationary point, which mm -hmm. may not be optimal, the only way to escape from that is by doing a rank one update, kind mm -hmm. of like you're describing. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. curious if you ever tried um, We haven't so much. I think it's hard. Uh, I mean, just getting the parameters right of like when you should sort of take the convex step and when you could take the non-convex step is a little bit tricky. I mean, just in terms um, of determining you actually have a stationary yeah, method. or not. Um, I mean, another way you can combine them is you can run the convex method for a while and then switch to the non-convex method. Um, that doesn't work so well for us because we're not able to reconstruct a low rank matrix until we get pretty close to it. Um, but I, I mean, maybe that's how close you have to be before the non-convex methods work. Um, but I think it's, um, it's often hard to evaluate f just on the basis of the data, right, without making assumptions about what the data should look like. Um, how close you have to be to the solution before the non-convex methods are going to converge to the global optimum. Um, and so that makes it hard to know when to switch. Um, yeah, yeah, OK. I, I, I know you're, you're suggesting something a little bit different, right, which is sort of expanding the rank until, until you can go in the right direction. And maybe this, uh, the convex methods can tell you um, uh, it, what if you're going to add a rank one um, uh, sort of matrix to your current uh, iterate? What rank one matrix should you add? So, yeah, I think that's also quite interesting. Sure. Questions? Yeah. Maybe you mentioned uh, so the storage. How does it depend on the approximation, your target approximation? Ah, so um, so uh, basically we hit those by just um, using factors of two. Um, so uh, if you want this two to be a one plus epsilon. Um, then um, the, uh, these uh, sort of k and l have to increase. I don't remember the precise dependence. Because um, for us, like 2 is really good enough. But something like 1 over epsilon squared, like, so polynomial. Yeah, yeah, something, some polynomial. Yeah. Yes? So I know for the theorem on terrafactorization, yes. like, if you take like, what, like square root of 2n samples, you can get like, like all solutions are very, very close to the global or something. So, I mean, probably that's way more than you have to want to take. You take it. If you make gauge, like, screw the. Ah, ah, ah. Um, yeah, I think that's bigger than we want to go. Yeah, right. I mean, we're, like, the idea here is that r is constant. Um, so, square root of n is a lot bigger than constant. I'm just curious if you try it just to see if then the. Yeah, just to see if the, if yeah. the wiggles would go away. I think that's an interesting. Um, yeah, that would be fun to try. Yeah. So in randomizers, PD, if the spectrum to a matrix decays slowly, you have to use this kind of power iteration to capture the, the range. Yes. So does the same thing can happen in your algorithm? Um, so I, I So I mean, you can certainly do better if you can do some kind of power iteration, um, but like but in, practice, in practice, you don't. Here, you don't need to. Um, so depending on how quickly your the tail decays of the singular values, you can get you can prove sort of tighter bounds if the tail decays quickly than less quickly. Um, but I mean, you can get a decent approximation even just using one pass. Uh, let's take measurement again. Great. Thank you.